so in this video we're going to talk about uh, redox titrations, could be really any titration but in higher chemistry of course it's redox titrations because they usually involve a redox reaction happening. So there's quite a bit practical you can get asked about in this and um, so hopefully you've done the experiment in class at some point so you'll be able to picture all the things I'm going to be talking about. But if not just google some of the phrases on and look up on videos on YouTube and I'm sure you'll find people doing things like making a standard solution and carrying out a titration if you haven't actually done one yourself. So to start off with I wanted to explain what titration actually is and what its purpose is. This is useful for open-ended questions using your knowledge of chemistry ones. So the purpose of them is to accurately determine the concentration of a sample. Um, so if you had a vitamin C tablet and you wanted to make sure there was sufficient vitamin C in it, you could do a titration. If you had an iron tablet and you wanted to work out how much iron was actually in the tablet, you could do the same thing. If you have a bottle of wine and you want to make it work out how much ethanol is in it, then you can use a titration. So you get the idea. It's for determining the concentration of things. How much of something is in something is the key. And they're very accurate if done accurately. <laughs> So one of the first things you need to do is prepare what's known as a standard solution. So you will need to know the definition of a standard solution and that is a solution of accurately known concentration. These are The definitions are always good to put on flashcards where you put the word on one side and the definition of the term on the other. You can play little games and get family involved. They can quiz you. So that's a definition you definitely need to know so give that a highlight in your notes. And key things to bear in mind about a standard solution that make your life a little bit easier is that they're made in a standard flask. So it, it, you can also call it a volumetric flask, but I find it easier to remember if you just call it a standard flask because it's a standard solution. So you make a standard solution in a standard flask and when you are making them, you should use distilled or deionized water because tap water contains metal ions that could alter the concentration of your solution, which is not ideal when you've got a standard solution that's meant to have an accurate concentration. When you're writing the answering the question about the use of distilled deionized water in an exam, you need to make sure you state that the tap water contains metal ions or another specific ion, but the most generic specific answer you can go with that's accepted is the metal ions. Now we're going to look at how we prepare a standard solution. So this gets asked about quite a lot for varying numbers of marks, depending on whether you need to calculate the amount of the solid you need to weigh out, or um, if you're asked to describe the process of weighing by difference. So knowing all of this information, and if you're not sure what information they want, in the exam just writing it all down anyway won't go amiss. So a standard solution which is a solution of accurately known concentration if you're most of the time making it from a solid you would weigh out the solid by placing the weighing boat on a balance and pressing the tear button and then adding in the mass required so you would have calculated based on the concentration of the solution you're trying to make how much of the solid you would need to add first of all. When you are asked to do that in the exam you just need to use the two mole relationships so use NCB first to work out the number of moles and then NMGFM after to work out the mass needed and then that would be the mass that was weighed out and then you would always record the mass that you actually weigh out at the end as well. So once you've weighed out your solid by the process of using the tear button you would dissolve, and the key word here is dissolve, if you dissolve the solid in a small volume of deionized water, in a small beaker, so I've written DI for deionized, just shorthand. So you weigh out the solid, you dissolve the solid in a small volume of deionized water, then you would transfer that into the standard flask with repeat rinsings, so that means you rinse out the beaker, pour it in, rinse out the beaker, pour it in to the flask numerous times. This repeat rinsing process is also known as transferring quantitatively and sometimes they will ask you in the exam what is meant by transferring quantitatively. It just means transferring with repeat rinsings. So it's the repeat rinsings that's the key bit. 
And then once you've done that, you fill the flask up with the ionised water till the bottom of the meniscus is on the line that's marked. And then you would stopper the flask and invert the solution to mix. And that's it. But the underlying bits are key. And if you are having to explain the process of weighing out a solid, you need to mention pressing the tear button. That's very important. Sometimes they will ask you about preparing a standard solution from a solution or a liquid. If that's the case, then instead of weighing out the solid, you just use a pipette to measure the volume required and add that straight into the standard flask. And then after that, it's just the same process of filling the flask with the ionized water until the bottom of the meniscus is on the marked line. The bottom of the meniscus, remember, is the bottom of that little dip that you get in a liquid within the um, tube and then stop it and invert to mix. One thing to bear in mind as well, pipettes are the most accurate piece of apparatus for measuring out volumes of liquids. However, that's only if the pipette is of that exact volume you need. So if there's a volume that you're trying to measure and you don't have a pipette with that exact volume, the next best thing is a burette. So pipettes are the best as long as you've got that exact volume of pipette, if not, the next best thing is a burette and never ever ever use a measuring cylinder to measure the volume of any liquids and i know at national five we let you do it but no 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 very inaccurate now we're on to the actual titration setup so you would have a clamp stand here the burette's not just floating and um, i just haven't drawn it in so you've got your burette which contains your standard solution and that can also be known as the titer so if you get anything known as like a tighter volume, that's the volume of the standard solution that was used. You'll notice the burette's filled to the, so the meniscus is on the, the bottom of the meniscus is on the zero line. But before you fill the burette up, you want to rinse it through with the standard solution first, just to clear it out. And then when you're filling the burette, you fill it above the zero line and then drain it until the bottom of the meniscus is on that zero line. Okay. Anytime you're taking a burette reading as well, it's always from the bottom of the meniscus. You've then underneath got your conical flask. The burette should be in the neck of the conical flask so that none of your standard solution is going to be lost out the sides. And then within your conical flask, you'll have your sample you're analysing plus an indicator. Um, the volume of the sample we measure using a pipette because that's the most accurate volume measurement. And the indicator... They quite often like to ask you why a titration wouldn't need an indicator. And if it doesn't need an indicator, that's because the reaction is self-indicating, which means the chemicals you're using will change colour on their own. So a common one for that is, is permanganate, acidified permanganate solution. It's a nice purple colour and it will go colourless when you put it in the conical flask. So it's nice purple in here. It goes in, it turns colourless, and then once you've added enough of it, it will the purple colour will stay. So the reaction is self-indicating and it goes from colourless to purple. Underneath the conical flask, you put a white tile. That gives a more precise end point. Oops, put, I realised I've said white tile. A white tile gives a precise end point. It doesn't help with accuracy because you could still be terrible at turning the tap, etc. So precision is where your results are all close together. So it means that you'll see the colour change at the same point every time um, accuracy is how close you are to the true result which is what taking the burette reading from the bottom of the meniscus does rinsing the burette through with the standard solution first um, other things that help with the accuracy are carrying out the rough titer first so that's where you find do an initial titration and find out roughly where the end point is going to be and then you don't include that result in your average calculation at the end. So the rough titration. Then also adding drop wise close to the end point. So once you've done your rough, you know roughly where the end point's going to be. So when you get within a couple centimetres cubed of that, in your second run through, you would add drop by drop very slowly using the tap. You would also want to swirl the conical flask frequently when you're doing the titration, if not constantly. I know it can be a bit tricky sometimes to coordinate that, but it comes with practice, trust me. And if you go study chemistry at uni, you'll do plenty of practice of titrations. 
So you can swirl the flask, that helps with accuracy. And then repeat for the concordant results, and that's within 0.2 centimeters cubed of each other. And then following the experiment, you would only calculate your average from any results that are concordant. So only the ones that are within 0.2 centimeters cubed of each other. So if you manage to do a rough and then get two concordant titrations after that, the minimum you'll ever do is three. But if your second and third titrations aren't concordant, then you'll need to do a fourth one and then keep going until you get two results that are concordant. And that is essentially the practical aspects of titrations. One last thing that I'm going to add in here, this is the ion electron half equation for the reaction with permanganate. When, so when you're using permanganate solution in your burette as a standard solution, this is the reaction that's happening to it. So this permanganate ion has the purple colour, the manganese is colourless, and that's why you get the colour change. But sometimes you will get asked why the per potassium permanganate needs to be acidified or the titration needs to be done in acidic conditions. It's because the reaction requires hydrogen ions. So if you remember from National 5, acids have high concentrations of hydrogen ions, lower concentrations of hydroxide ions. So if you've got a reaction that needs hydrogen ions, it needs to be done in an acidic environment. Otherwise, there'll be not enough hydrogen ions for the reaction to proceed. So... That's all the practical need to knows for titrations. Hope that was helpful. Please like and subscribe.